Good evening and welcome. I'm Marion Dry, Chair of Class Act HR 73, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Class Act Forum, Environment on the Ballot in 2024 and Beyond. Class Act Forums bring experts and thought leaders together to discuss the critical issues of our time with the object of helping us become better informed and active citizens in this democracy and the world. Class Act HR 73, Class Achieving Change Together is an important organization developed in 2013 to provide members of the Harvard Radcliffe class of 1973 and others with opportunities to work together to create positive change in the areas of justice and civic engagement, education, health and the environment. With the aid of the Harvard Alumni Association, we share our class act model with many Harvard classes and I'm pleased to say that the class act movement is growing. To learn more about class act HR 73's work, how you might join us and to see videos of our forums, please go to the class act website, classacthr73.org. We are a nonprofit and nonpartisan organization. The new views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this forum belong solely to the speakers and do not necessarily represent the views of Class Act HR 73. This forum was developed by Class Act's Environment and Climate Change Working Group, which is led by John Cress, one of tonight's panelists. In fact, all of this evening's panelists are members of the group. I'd now like to introduce our moderator. Jacqueline Swearingen, 73, is a retired journalist and historian who has written and taught about environmental concerns in the United States and East Asia. Jackie reported on economic and political issues for the Asian Wall Street Journal, the Detroit News, and the Miami Herald. At Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, she taught East Asian and European history, international relations, and science and technology studies. Jackie, I am delighted to hand this over to you. Good evening. When you cast your ballot this fall, you will proclaim your stand on the fate of countless other species that face extinction if we allow global temperatures to rise at the current pace. The environment stands at the forefront of the issues we all must reckon with this fall. We feel powerless when we hear reports that more than 1 million species will disappear as early as 2030. Our despair rises when we read in the New York Times that tipping points like the destruction of half of the Amazon forest and the deaths of at least 70% of coral reefs could occur by the middle of this century. Those warnings remind us that unless we act fast, many of the world's citizens, the majority already impoverished, will suffer displacement, famine, and heat-related deaths. The world we leave to our children and grandchildren will become unrecognizable. We cannot forget that we have some agency. We need to inform ourselves about the environmental policies of the candidates on our ballots this year, from the federal down to the local level. Races for state legislatures, State Supreme Courts and public resource commissions matter enormously in this struggle for the earth. These five members of the class of 1973 have worked for decades to protect the lands and the seas that the great Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson exhorted us to preserve. Please let me introduce this distinguished panel, beginning with James Engel. James Engel is the Gurney Research Professor of English Literature and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. Professor Engel chaired the Department of English and the Department of Comparative Literature. A faculty associate of the Salata Institute for Climate and Sustainability, as well as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he taught environmental courses at Harvard, Harvard, 
the National Humanities Center, and at Waseda University in Tokyo. His writings on climate and environmental education include Environment, an Interdisciplinary Anthology. Bob Dreer has served as Associate Director of the Fish and Wildlife Service and as Acting Assistant Attorney General for Environment and Natural Resources for the Department of Justice and as Deputy General Counsel of the Environmental Protection Agency. He represented environmental organizations and tribes as an attorney for earth justice and counseled businesses and private practice. Most recently, he served as the Potomac Riverkeeper Network's legal director before retiring this fall. Anne McKinnon has been a journalist in Wyoming since 1979. She covered energy and environment in a state whose revenues have long depended on coal, oil, and gas production. She soon became fascinated with how scarce water is divided up in Western states. She has taught natural resource policy courses for the University of Wyoming and consulted for the Wyoming state government on Colorado River issues. In 2021, she published Public Waters, Lessons from Wyoming for the American West. Jason Clay is the World Wildlife Fund's Senior Vice President and Executive Director of its Markets Institute. Dr. Clay launched the World Wildlife Fund's work on agriculture, livestock, and aquaculture and reshaped its work with the private sector and on fisheries. During his career, he has worked on a family farm and in the U.S. Department of Agriculture, taught at Harvard and Yale, and spent more than 35 years working in human rights and environmental organizations. He is the National Geographic's first ever Food and Sustainability Fellow and in 2013, he was awarded Tufts University's Jean Mayer Global Humanitarian Award. Dr. W. John Kress is Distinguished Scientist and Curator Emeritus at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. He was formerly Undersecretary for Science at the Smithsonian and co-chair of the Earth Biogenome Project an international effort to generate complete genomes for all species of plants, animals, and fungi on the planet. He currently serves as co-chair of the Vermont Biodiversity Alliance, a coalition of individuals, educators, businesses, conservation organizations, and state agencies. He believes that working at the local level can have a profound impact on global biodiversity protection. We begin with James Ingle, whose groundbreaking work in climate education and advocacy draws inspiration from his scholarship in the humanities and English literature, including the poetry of William Wordsworth and the writings of Henry David Thoreau and Rachel Carson. Thanks very much, Jackie. It's great to uh, see so many people on this webinar. I wanted to start with a point that's obvious, but uh, good to keep in mind, which is that every significant movement, social or political, of consequence has always been connected with the vote, whether it's for women's rights or civil rights, or whether it's the labor movement or whether it's, say, voting for young people, reducing the voting age from 21 to 18. And that is certainly true of the environmental movement, whether we go back to the 1970s or at the present time and for the future. The vote is absolutely key to any kind of fundamental change. I also think that this decade and the next decade are going to see consequential policies in the environment with regard particularly to climate, but also with food, water, air, use of plastics, and that these decisions in the next 10 to 15 years are going to resonate at least for the next century or more. Once many policies are put in place, they're often not easy to change or 
to reverse. So the ballot actually does determine significantly a lot of environmental policies and regulations at national levels, at state levels, and of course at local levels. And many of these remain in force for decades. So for example, in 2008, Ecuador gave nature legal status and rights. In the state where I now live, Montana, the constitution that was drawn up about 50 years ago gives every citizen the right to a clean and healthy environment, which the constitution says ought to be improving. There are also levels at local uh, questions such as zoning, uh, whether or not to use plastics, uh, agricultural conservation easements. Businesses are of course guided by policies and regulations that very often begin with votes cast for or against certain candidates. Uh, for example, mandating renewable energy or water usage or what pesticides can be used. And I think we shouldn't forget that voting for even county officials, county commissioners, or public service commissioners, these often have huge effects even beyond, say, voting for someone who's in the Senate or the House. These decisions that are more local can be terribly important. And in many jurisdictions, we vote for judges. That's easy to forget, and we often don't inform ourselves of the positions and the history of candidates for judicial office. So to vote on environmental and sustainability questions affects not only our generation, but future generations. And I think one major question we need to keep in mind is, are we really borrowing from our children's future? There's a Native American proverb that says, we do not so much inherit nature and the earth from our ancestors as we borrow it from our children. The whole question of intergenerational justice with regard to environment is a significant one. Vested interests, of course, don't always pursue environmental goals. And short-term gains for a minority or even a small minority are often things that are inimical to environmental goals. So I hope that people will inform themselves of all of the policies, positions, the potential trade-offs, and the actual history of the candidates that you'll be asked to vote for soon in this coming election and in future ones. Thank you. Next, we hear from Bob Dreer, whose work as a principal lawyer for the EPA and the DOJ as well as for nonprofits, has resulted in cleaner air and water for us all. Thank you. I want to talk about a, a, what I think is a, a evolving and uh, concerning change in our paradigm in this country about who we turn to for protection of our environmental rights. We've relied on federal protections for the environment for more than 50 years. The landmark federal laws protecting the environment, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and others, were enacted in the 1970s at a time when there was bipartisan recognition in Congress that states and localities were failing to do enough to protect our air, water, and land, and that national standards were needed. Well, that bipartisan environmental consensus has long since eroded, and we cannot now rely on a bitterly divided Congress to act to defend our environment. Worse, a deeply conservative Supreme Court is undermining federal environmental protections, reducing the scope of basic laws like the Clean Water Act, undermining administrative enforcement, reversing long-standing deference to federal agency expertise, and imposing judge-made requirements for extraordinary clarity in statutory language that tie EPA's hands in confronting pressing environmental challenges. So in the face of a crippled Congress and a deeply conservative Supreme Court, it's becoming deeply clear that we can no longer rely on federal protections to fully protect our air and water. Environmental advocates need to work at state and local levels to fill gaps left in federal laws by conservative judi judicial decrees and to ensure that citizens have the right to invoke protections under state law where they've lost federal protections. I want to describe one successful effort in Maryland to fill the gap created by a particularly damaging Supreme Court decision. 
In Sackett versus EPA, the Supreme Court in 2023 radically rewrote the longstanding understanding of the scope of the nation's waters subject to the Federal Clean Water Act. EPA and the courts had for years grappled with the extent to which the act covered wetlands, but reversing decades of administrative interpretation that protected adjacent wetlands, the Supreme Court in May 2023 held that to qualify for protection, wetlands had to have a direct surface connection to another navigable body of water, making them indistinguishable from the surface water itself. The conservative justices also asserted that only rivers and streams with relatively permanent flows were themselves protected under the Clean Water Act, excluding intermittent and ephemeral streams, which make up more than half the nation's waters. So the Supreme Court's reinterpretation of the act in one, one blow deprived more than half of the nation's wetlands and arguably half of its rivers and streams of federal protection. Unless Congress acts, at forlorn hope, I think, the only hope for protection for such wetlands and streams now lies with the states. Unfortunately, state protections for wetlands vary widely. Even states with strong laws have relied on the federal government to take the lead and lack the staff and budgets to enforce wetlands protections. Maryland is a good example. Maryland has strong state laws covering all its, wet, all its wetlands and waters in the state, but very limited resources to implement its program. And there's a critical gap where the Federal Clean Water Act allows citizen suits by organizations like the one I was working with, the Potomac Riverkeeper, to supplement federal and state agency enforcement capabilities. State law did not. Citizen suits are a critical tool to ensure protections of wetlands and streams where state or federal agencies either can't or won't take action to enforce the law. Working with a broad coalition of environmental groups, the Potomac Riverkeeper Network, where I worked, lobbied for state legislation to cure this gap. And in May of this year, we succeeded in winning an act, enactment of the Clean Water Justice Act. The bill authorizes citizen suits under state law for violations of state standards, and it's targeted precisely at the gap created by the Sackett decision at the federal level. It protects wetlands that lack surface connection to other waters, and, to, and it also protects intermittent and ephemeral streams. And it awards the courts, it, it authorizes the courts to award attorney's fees, a crucial uh, uh, right. Environmental advocates in other states are similarly working to ensure that their state laws fully protect wetlands and smaller streams to fill the whole Sackett left in federal law. And these efforts, I think, are examples of how we can turn to state legislatures and state environmental agencies to ensure continued protection of environmental values, even in the face of restrictions in the longstanding federal programs we've come to, to know and trust. We can't afford to rely solely on those federal programs. We have to reinvigorate the tradition of state-based environmental protections to fill the vacuum left by an ineffective Congress and a court that is deeply hostile to the environment. Thank you. Anne McKinnon has worked as a newspaper editor, a university professor, and a consultant understanding of natural resource issues in the Rockies. Her expertise on water issues is of critical importance in these days that in a state that hosts the headwaters of the Mississippi, the Colorado, and the Snake River systems. Thank you. I think a, another example to follow up on what Rob said, the Colorado River is an interesting example of the importance of state action. There are seven states uh, and parts of Mexico that are provided water by the Colorado River. And the about a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, all the states recognized that this was a resource that they had to all that they were sharing and they had to figure out how to work with it. And about 20 years later, the a treaty with Mexico brought that aspect of the river into how the river has been managed. But beginning in about 2000, climate change has had an impact, which scientists in the area call aridification of the Colorado River Basin. This is not drought. It is a fundamental change. Uh, and the several generations later, from 20, 1922, when a compact was signed between all the states on how they were going to manage it. Now these generations have to once again recognize, oh, we're sharing this with people, with people we don't know, states we hate, you know, whatever, downstream and upstream. And since 2000, uh, they have done a good job of learning each other's problems and figuring out how to use less. And uh, the environment has been considered because of the active participation of 
various environmental groups. And in, in the last 10 years or so, the tribes along the river, of which there are a not good number, have been pushing for and slowly gaining a voice in how the river should be managed. So one of the important things in this election is to realize how important it is to know about and support the people who are make, who are doing these negotiations. Uh, in some states like Arizona, the whole legislature has to agree to whatever gets figured out. In other states like mine in Wyoming, it's really the state engineer and the governor, but they have lots of advisory groups advising them. So it's important to follow that and to support it and also to support federal legislation funding, which interestingly enough, the um, bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, which were passed uh, early in the current administration, actually have come up with important funding for people at all levels in that river uh, to sometimes experiment and sometimes go ahead with changes so that they can use less water. 80% of the water in the Colorado is still used in agriculture. So it's not, although the urban areas are making a big effort, it's not really an urban issue. It's a major uh, agricultural issue. Meanwhile, on all kinds of other things, as uh, James and Bob have noted, the uh, all the way from school district, school board elections, where there are real questions in some states about whether climate change education is going to occur, be allowed to, to occur through city and county um, elections, commissioners, councils who make land use decisions that have a major impact on land and water and also on pollution levels, crowded crowds, that kind of thing. Uh, also often on local aquifers that are affected by, uh, by residential development. Then up to state legislatures, uh, a number of them have their environmental statutes, which allows their agencies to have what's called primacy in the enforcement of even federal uh, environmental law. But if there is not adequate staff and funding, which there is not, for instance, in my state, then that enforcement at the local, at the state level doesn't really happen. And then of course, on to the, uh, the congressional, the Senate and the house races, it's important to think about both where they are on such issues as support for the Colorado River negotiations and experimentation with water use reduction, and also such things as potential changes in the National Environmental Policy Act, which a number of, of uh, senators from Western states have long sought to change. The, it's called, the, that act is called NEPA and it requires an analysis of the environmental impact of any federal action. Uh, and congressional people, House and Senate from all over the country need to be aware of any proposed changes in that and the other major federal laws uh, and so as to be able to take a position on it. So I think it's very important for uh, voters to, for you and your friends to be aware of what the positions are of people at all those levels of government. Thank you. I think Jackie may have had some trouble with her <clears throat> internet. It was a little sporadic. Why don't I introduce Jason, and then Jason can introduce me if Jackie doesn't get back on. There we go. There you are. <laughs> Jason and I have known each other for quite a while. He's an internationally recognized leader in envisioning the fate and the future of agriculture. He combines an understanding of agriculture innovation, which is so important these days, with the grasp of global community commodities market and remain, reminds that we need to bring nature and ecosystems back into farming. Farming is not gonna go away. Jason knows how to integrate it with biodiversity. Jason, please. So he's now given half of my talk. So uh, <laughs> I'll Sorry. see what I can do by introducing him. Um, so, so we talk about half earth and 30 by 30 and 50 by 50 and th that's all well and good, 
But I focus on the other half of the earth, the half that we use to live on in a more day in, day out basis, and that we have altered, not irrevocably, but certainly substantially. Uh, and the production of food is the major driver of habitat and biodiversity and even ecosystem services loss around the planet. Uh, as I've said many times, if it comes to a choice between uh, cutting a tree or feeding a child, the child's going to win every time. And so here's, here's the reality in the lifetime of this particular group, at least in my lifetime. I think that's kind of yours too. Um, we've gone from 2.5 billion people on the planet to 8.2 billion since we were born. Uh, the people are bigger, 20 to 25% bigger. They live longer, nearly 30 years longer. Uh, they eat more, they eat differently, and they have more money to spend on food. Since 1980, food production has doubled. Global trade in food has increased four times, uh, so that the speed of trade has increased even faster than production of food. And trade represents about 30% of of global, globally produced food. Trade, trade is critical for sustainability. Uh, comparative advantage is real. It's also critical for food security and about uh, 25 to 30% of countries now depend on food imports to keep people from starving. It's also important to address climate change by having the ability to produce food in different parts of the world when, when the weather is better in any given year or the climate hasn't heated as much. All of this is to say that where and how we produce food uh, is critically important and it's gonna become even more so. Now let's look at that through the climate lens. Global food produces about 30 to 35% of greenhouse gas emissions. And we know that for all sectors really, we have we need absolute reductions on the order of 60 to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. For food, we also need that for soil health. We need to improve soil health. We need it for water use. We need it for water pollution. We need it for habitat. We need it for ecosystems and for biodiversity. So food is even more, more complicated. We know how to reduce emissions 60 to 80% for transport and for uh, energy. We haven't done it yet. And we're slow to do it. We're still actually increasing emissions, but at least the technology is available and it, it can be done. There is no silver bullet for food. It's a lot more complicated. So here's, here's what we know. The least efficient 10 to 20 producers on the planet for food, any food commodity, cause about 60 to 80% of the impacts. This applies to soil health, it applies to deforestation, but it also applies to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, those same 10 to 20% produce about 5% of the, of the crops. So to date, we've really focused on how to reward the better producers, how to move them along. If we're going to reduce impacts absolutely by 60 to 80%, there's no way we can do that without moving the bottom. And our strategies need to focus now on the worst performers and how to get them into something else, how to make them better, or how to pivot them from commodity crop production to producing carbon sequestration and environmental services and bringing nature back into farming. Uh, we've, we've, again, we focus on nature in the areas of pristine nature, but we need to start bringing nature into farming to increase productivity, to increase pollinators, to increase uh, stream flow and continuity over time, the quality of the water, et cetera. So how do we shift subsidies away from old crops and old programs towards the new ones we need to be more resilient in the face of climate change? How do we help farmers retire? Half of global farmers and ranchers are over uh, 54 to 60 degrees, excuse me, 60 years. And, and so they are less e efficient, but simply by stopping producing commodities, they could produce more carbon. They could produce other environmental services. And with those funds, 
We've heard a lot about harmful subsidies and the need to get rid of them. I would argue we don't really want to get rid of the subsidies. We want to pivot how they're used. We want to use them to encourage innovation, uh, to ensure early actors so that they come up with the innovations that we need uh, in a changing world. Uh, and we need to focus our government programs not on the adoption of practices, but on the production of results. How do we produce more using less land? Uh, we've achieved peak land, now we need to achieve peak greenhouse gas emissions, peak water use, and begin to get to these absolute reductions. All of this happens in the US in the Farm Bill at a federal level, but it also happens uh, at a local level around food waste, around composting, around environmental uh, practices uh, and other types of concessions for land use for farming. But I think the final thought that I wanna leave you with is that going forward, given our dependence on trade and every country is dependent on trade, we've gotta figure out how to manage the planet, not just how to manage a farm or a county or a state or a country. All of our supply chains are global uh, and we compete, but we also depend on those global markets. So from an environmental point of view, trade agreements are a huge issue to get right. Thank you. John Kress has taken the lessons he learned from his Harvard professor, E.O. Wilson, to become a renowned botanist and an international leader in championing biodiversity. His most recent accomplishment is the landmark book, Smithsonian Trees of North America, which Yale University Press will publish next month. Great, thank you, Jack. I'm gonna to touch on some of the same things that we've already heard from. I'm gonna focus primarily on bi uh, biodiversity conservation, and I'm going to take a concept that has been mentioned, 30 by 30, and trace it from the international level all the way down to the state and local level. So you get some idea of what is happening in terms of voting and uh, environmental issues at each of these levels. Uh, E.O. Wilson has been mentioned a number of times. In 2016, he published a seminal book on conservation of biodiversity across the planet called uh, Half Earth. And in it, he said, if we're going to do anything to save biodiversity, we're going to have to protect 50% of the land and oceans on the planet with no intervention from humans to make sure biodiversity stays uh, viable. That was in 2016. Uh, that idea was picked up quite rapidly by international conservationists around the world. Uh, in fact, uh, and it became a concept known as first 50 by 50, because the idea was 50% protection by the year 2050. Some understood that that was maybe a little bit a too large a step at this point. And so they adopted it, something called 30 by 30. That's 30% 30 protection of the planet by the year 2030. And that idea of 30 by 30 and 50 by 50 has now been translated into a number of legislations and is going to be on the ballot more and more as far as I can see. Uh, the first action that happened was uh, the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity of the United Nations at their international meeting in 20. 22 in Montreal adopted 30 by 30 as their target three, one of 23 targets, as one of the main aspects that the world needed to apply as soon as possible to stop uh, biodiversity construction, uh, destruction. Uh, that was adopted and signed by the Global Biodiversity Framework by 196 countries around the world. So that was a major international effect in terms of biodiversity conservation. At the same time, our own government through the current uh, executive, as mentioned earlier by Ann, had initiated uh, a couple of major bills, bipartisan bills, to support a lot of different things in terms of infrastructure uh, and in terms of just living processes within the US. And one of those or any also included millions of dollars for biodiversity conservation. In fact, in those bills, uh, the idea of 30 by 30 was even mentioned explicitly. So the idea is caught on not just around the world, but also in, a, in our own country. 
the next step forward after that was California, one of the largest and um, most economically important states in our country, starting in 2020, but then finally in 2022, adopted its own bill called the bipartisan, excuse me, called Pathways to 30 by 30 bill. This was a uh, executive order by governor, by the governor of California that allocated $750 million to biodiversity conservation across the state, particularly to advance the idea of 30 by 30. And moving on to 50 by 50 after that, uh, after that uh, is achieved. Vermont became the second state all the way across the United States from California, the first state, to Vermont in the east, also enacted its own 30 by 30 bill just this past year. Uh, Vermont has been working on conservation for many years and we're known as the Green Mountain State because of the amount of forests uh, here and the amount of conservation that's going on, not only in forests, but in also in agricultural land and other types of, of protection. This bill called Act 59, which was just accepted about a year ago by the state legislature was called Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act. And it's explicitly, again, mentioned E.O. Wilson's Half Earth Idea and the International Convention on Biological Diversity, their promotion of 30 by 30. Uh, this bill, interestingly enough, was not signed by the governor of the state. It still passed and became law in July of last year. So things do happen in terms of voting and in terms of environmental things on the ballot that are not always in the most direct way. I think I have another minute. And what I wanted to say was, well, to summarize, here we start with Harvard, Harvard professor introducing the idea of half earth. It goes on to the Convention on Biological Diversity and is op and is approved, tar is approved, the US government of dollars going for biodiversity conservation in 30 by 30, then goes on to the state of Vermont. So we see this progress of, of how we can achieve environmental protection from the international level. One more comment is this did not happen overnight in Vermont. And I just want to say as a Vermonter that this took eight years. Even though the idea of 30 by 30 has been around, there are at least five or six different bills that were passed different design plans, different allocations that happened uh, before Act 59 came into being just a year ago. So I just wanna encourage everyone to think about what they can do locally, nationally, internationally, uh, to things like 30 by 30 concept. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. And thanks to all our panelists for offering us a look at the work they have been doing to protect biodiversity, to combat climate change, to integrate environmental goals into agricultural and market practices, to preserve wetlands and forests, and to distribute water responsibly and equitably. We invite them now to engage in an open-ended discussion about confronting environmental challenges and promoting the solutions we heard about tonight. We would like to begin by posing a question that links tonight's forum with the two previous Class Act HR 73 forums that were inspired by E.O. Wilson's concept of half earth the idea that we should set aside half of the Earth's land and seas to provide sufficient habitat for the species that remain and to prevent their extinction. Uh, could we hear from each of you about what steps you think we are as voters and citizens to promote that goal of half the Earth? Um, I'd like to begin by asking that question to John who has done so much good work studying and encouraging biodiversity as a scientist and as an environmental activist. Uh, thank you, Jackie. I won't directly answer your question right now because I'd like to start with something different. Even though I tried to be somewhat positive in my opening comment there about successful actions from the international to the local level, uh, less than a week ago, I was actually quite discouraged about where we're going. And this is due to I spent an hour and a half watching a presidential debate. And I thought it was extremely interesting and discouraging that I listened for an hour and a half, and it wasn't until the last few minutes that the environment 
climate change and biodiversity conservation was even mentioned. It was brought up by the moderators as a final question on what would each candidate do. The first candidate to respond immediately changed the topic to the economy and jobs. Didn't even mention conservation biodiversity. The second candidate immediately turned the question to the automobile industry, thinking about the, the, the objects that are creating the, possible, the problem of fossil fuels in the atmosphere and not addressing exactly what was happening on the ground. Uh, I thought it was actually quite discouraging. Uh, but then again, that's, and I think maybe Bob said at the beginning or Jim said it, this is what we're up against. We do have to work at all these levels, but this is what we're up against. And I would like to maybe to hear some of my panelists' comments if they had the same reaction as I did at that debate less than a week ago. And um, your commitment to conserving the life-giving Colorado River and understanding the legal and historical claims upon it are so critical at this point. Um, would you like to respond to what John was saying? As a personal note, I was deep in the mountains of the headwaters of the Colorado when that debate took place, and I haven't been able to bring myself to listen to it or watch. But one thing that has really struck me is I said more and more voices are coming into this Colorado River discussion. And as I was listening to Jason, uh, because it struck me that the, because of the federal money that's going into okay, how can we help you guys adapt? It's a perfect moment to say, how can we help some of you retire and your heirs can do something else like carbon sequestration? How can we maybe avoid so many golf courses and do something else in the Southwest? And using that money, which are big incentives, they come from those statutes, but the, the bipartisan stuff uh, from this administration, but they're still being implemented. So I, I, and I think there will be calls for more money as of course there always is. So I think it would be a pretty interesting opportunity to sort of use that money or, or craft how that money is directed along the lines that Jason was talking about to really figure out how to bring more of the environment into agriculture. And, and that I think will allow uh, the Colorado River Basin is not half of the U.S., but it's a big chunk, and that will allow more um, more preservation of natural uh, habitat for species. Jason, uh, you saw the interconnection of agriculture and environmental health and human rights long before many of the rest of us had. Um, could I ask you to um, comment on what Anne was saying? Um, and bring agriculture into the discussion as you did previously? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we have to look at these things in, in the long term. I, I noted that John was talking about Vermont being the green mountain state because it's so green, but let's look at the colonial period when 90% was cleared uh, for farming and ranching. Uh, and then it was retired because it wasn't feasible and it moved on. The same with the Adirondacks. Uh, I think we have the ability to bring nature back, not biodiversity, but ecosystem services and, and, and water functions, et cetera. But we, the biggest issue I think is not just to create awareness, but also then strategies that work. And we are at an inflection point where a lot of people want to retire. They want to make a living. They want to stay on their properties. They don't have heirs that want to farm. They've, they've, paid their way through schooling and technical uh, skills to get to other places, but they are the perfect people to be stewards of this if we can show them how to make money and create markets that they can actually make money staying where they are, because they will be guardians of this area once they see that there's a living in it. Uh, but I want to go back to the awareness piece. And at one point in my career, um, the Grateful Dead did a, a rainforest benefit, and it was actually almost almost 36 years ago to this day, uh, September 24th in 1988. We did a big press conference. It got about 1,500 clips. We, I started working with companies to buy rainforest products to create uh, money to protect those forests. 
And what we found when we did focus groups was in Chicago, in Boston, New York, Atlanta, and San Francisco, not a single American knew what a rainforest was. Now, that's only 36 years, and we've come a long way since then. Uh, but there's a difference between awareness and action. And I think now we need to get the action in place. And that means inevitably around land use, it means policies. Uh, it means policies that help these adjustments happen, that allow them to be tax deductible. I mean, why do we have foundations in the US? Because people could park their money there and not pay taxes on it. Well, we need to figure out a same way to move forward. Maybe it's land trusts, maybe it's other kinds of things, but we've just scratched the surface of that. Bob, you've been at the forefront of legal struggles to preserve natural habitats and resources since you graduated from law school. Um, how might you uh, add to what Jason was saying, particularly in terms of his call for policies? When you look at what we need to achieve 30 by 30 and then ultimately 50 by 50, um, it, it's an interconnected web of resource protections at every level. Um, if you start, you know, we did analysis of this when I was working with Defenders of Wildlife and other groups have certainly done it. If you start with federal land systems, you can achieve um, in some parts of the country pretty close to 30% protection if those federal lands, in fact, are carefully managed and protectively managed, so they're not always. But that's a, that's the backbone of the start of a structure. But you look at other parts of uh, the country where biodiversity is particularly high and particularly at risk, like the Southeast. And the only way you protect biodiversity in the Southeast is by working with private landowners through conservation. Conservation practices uh, such as you know land trusts, as we mentioned, um, but also conservation practices with farmers and uh, and and subsidies under the farm bill, um, state lands, state forests, and state parks. Um, there's opportunities. What I'm saying is there's opportunities for people to engage all across this country and at every level. If they're more comfortable working at a local level, they can find people that are engaged in conservation practices. The Potomac watershed, for example, uh, the Potomac River Keeper, where I was working, uh, you know, works closely with the Potomac Conservancy, which works on upland conservation and is a, is a great uh, uh, force for, for land conservation. You can find these opportunities at local and regional levels. You can also work to try to preserve um, federal protections and and the management of federal lands, but it will take all of us. I mean, the, the old idea that it takes a village, it will take all of us to try to do this. And it's directly related to climate change because it's going to take levels of, of action by all of us at every level to address climate change successfully. The good news, I think, is that if you're looking for a way to get involved, um, there's lots of opportunities and, and there's lots of people who are now engaged and will help make a community with you. Well, I think that takes us uh, to a lot of the work that Jim's been doing. Um, Jim, you have helped in so many ways to remind us all of the urgent necessity of addressing climate change. You've educated audiences beyond the university about how we should band together to care for the earth. Um, I know you've spoken before about the need uh, for mass movements as well as tonight. Um, what would you suggest in terms of uh, what we've been discussing in, in the roundtable so far? Well, thanks very much, Jackie. I would stress what several of the other panelists have mentioned, most recently Bob, and that is whether we talk about half Earth or whether we talk about 30 by 30 by 2030. These are important goals, laudable goals. Uh, and I don't mean in any way to minimize them, but achieving them will mean a great deal less than it could or should unless we act on climate change urgently. It is very clear that we have already passed the 1.5 degrees centigrade goal set at the Paris Accords. We will not meet it. That's simply clear. We need a few more years of data to make that absolutely confirmatory, but no climate scientist thinks we're going to meet 1.5 degrees. Very few think that we're going to meet 2 degrees centigrade, and many of them believe we're headed for a 3 degrees centigrade world. That is frightening in many respects because it will change ecosystems, 
So setting aside land or water uh, under those conditions meaning means that that land and that water itself is going to be changed a great deal. Biodiversity will be lost. It will be harder to farm. It will be harder to live for many people in many areas. We'll have climate refugees, we'll have political instability, and we'll have financial instability. In addition to which, for the longer term, we'll have rising seas. Already we know that sea levels are going to rise for centuries, that nothing will stop them. So we are facing a climate situation which is truly urgent. I mean, there are some physicists who say uh, already that we are facing a doomsday scenario. I talked with some of them this pa uh, past week in Washington, D.C. They feel very discouraged by where we're headed on climate. So slashing emissions is absolutely vital. We will need to take carbon dioxide and out of the atmosphere. There are a number of methods to do that. But right now, even though we're employing some of them, uh, their impact so far has been minuscule. And we may even need to contemplate solar geoengineering. That is where a lot of climate scientists are increasingly turning their views, uh, despite the moral hazard involved uh, with it. So climate is ubiquitous. And unless we do something about it, our other efforts, however laudable, uh, will be... Uh, minimized to some degree. Uh, they may even in some instances be defeated. We're in a, a perilous situation and what we do in the next 10, 15 years on climate is going to determine so much in the future. I think something else we can do is we can educate people on climate. There's still a lot of um, misinformation and disinformation about climate. Does your school require environmental courses as, as a public school? Uh, do colleges require uh, some work in the environment for graduation, some information on climate? Uh, most schools and colleges don't do this at all. I think it's uh, imperative that we educate our young people on that. Uh, the fact that this question on environment and climate came at the tail end of a presidential debate is discouraging. A lot of voters list climate somewhere between priority number seven and priority number 16 on their, on their voting priority. And sadly enough, it seems, according to polls, that people who list it as number one and two as a group vote less often than other people. Uh, which is truly discouraging. But I just wanted to make that simple point that climate is foundational for absolutely everything else. And unless we act on that, our other actions uh, will, however strenuous they are, uh, not be what they could be. Thanks. John, could I ask you how, uh, as uh, an activist, one might... Um, integrate uh, action on climate change with action on biodiversity? It's already being done. And I, I probably would disagree a bit with Jim on his statement that climate is foundational. I think climate change and the cause of climate change are integrally li linked with biodiversity loss and the conservation of species. Uh, if you look at one of the biggest carbon sinks in the world, it's forests. And so protecting 50% of the forests, you're going to maybe with, with or without bio uh, geoengineering, you, you might be able to at least make some headway on this problem. But I would hate to see climate change versus biodiversity conservation become an, an issue. And I know you weren't just implying that, Jim, but I think we need to be careful of what we, uh, how we- No, they're all, they're all interlinked. You're right, yeah. John, they're all interlinked, absolutely. But if we keep on, I mean, last year, global emissions were at an all time historical high. If we keep that up, the trajectory is one of failure for so much else. Yeah, and we should have our other panelists chime in, but my feeling is that will affect all species on the planet. And whatever we can do to preserve some of those species besides Homo sapiens is an important thing to do. Could I ask uh, someone else then to join in, um, say, 
Uh, partic Jason, I know you've worked with the whole question of deforestation and agriculture, which seems to me very much a key question in bio preserving biodiversity and also reducing carbon uh, as a, in terms of a, a forest being carbon sinks. So I think that the issue here is that that from a greenhouse gas point of view, if deforestation occurs in a in a commodity supply chain, wherever it occurs, it is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. That's how important the carbon is in the forest. We did analyses of, of 12 different global commodities, uh, and that was always the case, even with things like rice with methane uh, production and, and even with, with cattle, uh, it was the same, uh, that if the land was cleared from forest, that was even a bigger impact than uh, the ruminants and, and the, the methane production from rumination of the, of the livestock. But I think that, that it's also the case that we need to uh, focus on the on on what the substitutes are that actually reduce those impacts. So we found that with traceability for soy, for example, from Brazil, you could reduce by half the emissions that were uh, being produced to produce global salmon if soy was included as a 15% ingredient in the feed. And so you do have the ability to reduce these emissions by having better traceability, better transparency about how things are, are produced. The EU, the EU uh, deforestation regulation is requiring uh, traceability all the way back to farms. China's starting to require some of this stuff. But, but we don't want this to go the way of voluntary standards, which was to reward the better producers and let the worst ones get off the hook, undersell and undermine the markets. So how do we put in global minimum performance standards so that traded food items have to be produced that maintain the environment or actually improve it? And if they don't, they're not allowed to be traded. When do we start putting environmental uh, protections in place under the WTO? Codex Alimentarius does this for human health and safety. Why not Codex Planetarius for planetary health and safety? Well, I think one of the reasons is it costs money. And uh, I think a lot of these decisions end up being short-term economic decisions rather than longer-term investment decisions. And somehow consciousness on that will have to change. I wanted to mention one fact related to a question in the chat. It has to do also with preservation of forests. Uh, last year, the wildfires in Canada, it is calculated, emitted more carbon dioxide than every nation's emissions except the top three emitters, China, India, and the United States. So that is to say those Canadian wildfires rank number four as a country in carbon dioxide emissions. <clears throat> this, this kind of cascading effect, these positive feedback loops are uh, especially dangerous. And they will have already, uh, they are already affecting uh, ice. Uh, we haven't talked at all about ice in the, in the webinar, but I think we ought to at least give it a minute or two. Um, the Greenland ice cap is disintegrating. It is accelerating in its disintegration. Uh, sea level is rising. And there are pretty strong indications that that acceleration uh, is occurring in sea level rise, that it's not constant. Um, the West Antarctic ice sheet, we know, is eventually going to become unstable. There's a lot of scientific consensus on that. We don't know when. Uh, there are various uh, estimates. And then perhaps more immediate in terms of human impact is a lot of mountain glaciers around the world are shrinking, and those that provide potable water for very large populations are certainly on a a shrinking trajectory. So all these things come into play as well. As John said, they're all interlinked. And unless we begin to have a, a stronger sense of managed connection of climate, agriculture, forest, biodiversity, uh, and human impacts on them, we'll be in trouble. 
um, it's a huge challenge, um, but uh, one that if we don't face is going to leave our grandchildren in a, a much altered and less comfortable condition. So let me jump in here. Um, there's a couple of things that you said, James, that I wanted to respond to. One was, you know, it all comes down to cost. We've actually done some calculations on that. When I was doing um, work with Rainforest Trade, uh, including Rainforest Crunch with Ben and Jerry's, I charged everybody who bought the commodities a 5% environmental premium, and they were required to pay this by contract. They couldn't buy from other people, and they had to pay that. And we guaranteed that 100% of that would go back to the communities and to generate you know, additional product and do basic value add to basically make the product more marketable in the supply chain. Nobody ever said that that 5% raised the price. We're now doing, because it's less than, it's less than half of 1% on the raw materials, which are six or 8% of a finished product. And so we're doing a 1% solution now. In fact, we're launching a climate week next week where there'll be a 1% environmental fee being proposed on food exports from places like Brazil, but also the US. In Brazil, that would generate about $800 million a year, every year, to address the biggest impacts of agriculture. Uh, it's not a huge amount of money, and that can be used to leverage an awful lot of other money, but it's getting the consumers to start paying for the cost, actual cost of production. Uh, and we've hired an ag economist, David Zilberman from Berkeley, who thinks it should be 5%. He thinks 10 might be too much. Uh, but five would certainly be unnoticeable. And so we're just trying to get this palatable. So 1% we think is, is something that we can sneak through almost. But these are the kinds of systems that we need for starting to manage the planet. I, I think you're right. I mean, it was 20 years ago when Sir Nicholas Stern said we should be spending 2 to 3% of our GDP every year. Uh, on climate, and we haven't come close to that. But the kind of plan you mentioned, Jason, is exactly what we need. And, and if we don't pay for it, what are the costs going to be? The costs are going to be countries that can't produce exports. And then what are future generations going to eat? Um, that I, I think that's an interesting point that you've raised in terms of um, where the costs lie. There's a debate right now in terms of uh, if, uh, say, uh, producers of fossil fuel are taxed, um, then they bear the cost of that tax. They are arguing that it should be consumers who use fossil fuels who should be taxed. And so I'm curious as to how all of you think we can begin to pay um, for all the work that needs to be done to um, fight climate change and protect biodiversity. Um, and, and we can certainly take it down to a state level. There's never going to be enough money. We need to find stranded assets and redeploy them. It's always about using waste. It's always about finding something nobody else wants and figuring out how to use it to fix a problem. I think now that older people want to retire, let's use that. You know, that's a stranded asset. We can take advantage of that. I just thought I'd chime in on exactly that point. I mean, it's um, one of the major environmental challenges that we face all around the country is um, literally hundreds of millions of tons of coal ash that is deposited um, in usually in groundwater and often uh, flooding into surface water near old coal-fired power plants hundreds of millions of tons of it, and it's highly toxic and it has uh, heavy metals in it. Um, one of the programs we're working with is that um, it turns out that you can uh, you can recycle coal ash and substitute it in the making of, of concrete, substitute it for Portland cement. And a ton of coal ash recycled into concrete saves a ton of carbon dioxide emissions. It's a ton for ton. And so, you know, we're looking for ways to incentivize that, uh, to try to subsidize it, because we need something to do with hundreds of millions of tons of coal ash that are polluting the environment. And it turns out that it's a huge climate benefit. It's a stranded asset. It's it's a waste, but it could reduce. And of course, you know, concrete production, as you guys know, is about 10 percent of global emissions of carbon dioxide. It's huge. It's almost as big as transportation. And they don't, you know, 
so I do think that that you know um, I hear this conversation and I and I worry about it leaving people feeling like it's hopeless. I don't think it's hopeless. I do think that we're going to face an inevitable level of change in the bio diversity and in the environment around us because of climate change that's already built in to some extent but i think there's an awful lot we can do to moderate that and to steer the earth as as you were saying to um so i'm still an optimist we need to think sideways we i need think to look, look at uh, how to connect the dots i think uh a lot of this points to jim's point about where is the education the requirements in high schools and below but also in colleges because we need some of those guys to be working on it fast i the people i know who are in their late 20s and 30s who are engineers or finance people or what this is the kind of stuff they're working on all the time but they did have an education that suggested to them that this is a problem so i i think it's worth uh emphasizing as a, as what Jim said about trying to make sure that your local community colleges and high schools and universities and lower and K through 12 uh, really talk to kids about climate change and how real it is because there are plenty of people in Western states at least and I'm sure others that still say it doesn't happen. It's not, it doesn't exist. And I think your comment brings up something we've repeated over and over that these issues go right down to the local level to boards of education and things that need to focus on the education of the children in their district in their state in their county and even at the national level uh, we can't avoid that in in light of uh what you just said john and ann as we move to the question and answer part of this webinar um, we've, I've found that um, a number of questions that our audience has submitted uh, relate to uh, aspects of their daily life and uh, their community's daily life. Uh, one of the first questions uh, talks about um, some of the programs to try and control uh, congestion in cities. Uh, Public transport uh, is a very important aspect of climate change. Uh, this audience member says, most Americans live in urban settings. Uh, any suggestions about what can be done um, in terms of uh, activism, lobbying, et cetera, uh, to deal with these questions of reducing uh, emissions in terms of public transportation and moving from place to place, uh, I, one of the one of the questioners mentioned the congestion pricing snafu in New York, and so obviously, New York voters need to weigh in on that in whatever way they can find. As well as there's got to be groups they can join who can tell them the best way to weigh in. It's a mystery to me why the governor made that decision, perhaps political pressure or certain interests. It's worked very well in London, for example. On the larger question about transportation, um, most elected officials have some views on public transportation, and they often don't rise to the top in debates or questions and the like. But they're exceptionally important. And uh, despite the increase in electric vehicles, the answer to our Transportation issues is not simply to build more roads and roadways, it's to have more public transportation uh, and to be willing to pay for it as well. Um, almost all public transportation is subsidized and uh, it's necessary. Of course, a lot of, of our highway system and our cars and so forth and fossil fuels, they're all subsidized too. But I think public transport is something deeply important and Unless we pay attention to it, not only are we going to see <clears throat> all aspects of the uh, environment degraded in some way, but we're going to economically lose in terms of time wasted and other things because public transportation is efficient not only environmentally, but economically in the long run. I do worry about the, uh, the interconnection 
I mean, sort of the linkage, unfortunately, between electrification of our of our automobile fleet and geopolitics. Um, one of the most important things we can do, I think, to try to encourage people to convert to electric vehicles is to lower their price. Um, and yet it seems very clear that, that the Biden administration um, and probably whatever successor administration comes in will uh, impose highly costly tariffs on Chinese vehicles, which currently cost half of what electric vehicles cost in the United States. And imagine how much good it would do for us if if very inexpensive and relatively high quality, from what I understand, electric vehicles were available at, you know, seventeen thousand dollars or twenty two thousand dollars a vehicle instead of forty five or fifty thousand. Um so I mean I worry about geopolitics. Of course geopolitics has a lot of other risks. Um war is a pretty major contributor to uh uh to climate and habitat destruction. So anyway, I just uh, it would be good if we could keep our eyes on the prize and um, and and try to move forward electrification of uh, of our transportation system. If I can say something here, also I know maybe you don't want to push it too much, but about urbanization, we now know that by the year 2050, 75 percent of the world's population will live in urban environments. So the problem we're talking about right now is not going to get any better soon. Uh, my feeling coming from a natural history museum background, a botanic garden background, uh, is an effort to try to keep people connected to nature somehow, particularly in city settings, is critical. If people are going to think about the environment, if people are going to think about conservation, if people are going to be able to keep it in their minds to vote for it, we somehow have to keep people connected to nature, particularly in these very densely populated areas. And there's ways to do that, but unfortunately, I think it's going the wrong direction right now. But I just wanted to make that point at this right now. Going back to this whole question of how uh, we can make change in our individual lives, um, one of the uh, audience members asked, um, could the panelists discuss the need to change our diets because of the inefficiencies and environmental problems of animal agriculture? And of course, we hear all the time, if we would reduce uh, the amount of meat we eat, that that would collectively have some impact. Um, is How true is that? And how, in terms of a mass movement, might we begin to make significant change? And this is the one you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> so... I have a I have a odd kind of stream of thoughts about this. I I grew up on a farm. I actually ran it from the age of fifteen after my father was killed in an accident before I went to college. And um, animal agriculture is a huge part of the farming business, and it is globally. Uh, it is also a part of diet that's not going to change because somebody says something else is better for you. Um, I spent about ten years working on on nutrition issues and the impact of development on nutrition. And in it, it is very clear that when people get more money and become more affluent, get above the poverty line, they'll spend it on food that they haven't been able to afford in the past. And what that means in terms of animal proteins is that we it's a two to three generation proposition to make this change happen globally. It's not in the next 10 years. And so, yes, we can, we are aware of this issue in North America and Europe, and we have other alternatives, not just of, of say, seafood protein, but non-animal-based proteins. A lot of other parts of the world haven't gone through the whole uh, process that we have, that we have gone through. But here's where I'm also hopeful the studies that I, sh I talked about that we where we found 60 to 80 percent of the impacts coming from 10 to 20 percent of the producers were also true for animal proteins. And that suggests that there may be a whole different strategy. I remember once I gave a, a talk to the dairy industry in in Europe and they are trying to make the best better. You know, they're trying to get better. And I said, if you really want to affect not just the reputation of the dairy industry, but the actual impacts of the dairy industry, you need to get your technologies into India and Africa because that's where the impacts are. That's what brings the whole average down. And the same goes with Brazilian beef. 
uh, by moving into places where they should not be growing animals. This brings the global average, it makes it worse. Now, I still think a better, a, we could all eat less meat. We could all have a day that we don't eat meat. That would have a huge, inter, you know, a, a huge impact on, on this issue globally. Uh, but I think notions that we're going to talk people into changing their diet is maybe not quite yet. Well, thank you so much. And I know that uh, we love to continue to answer questions, but I think it's time to turn uh, this part of the webinar over to Marion for the calls to action. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you all of you. Uh, each webinar, we share uh, calls to action so that those who are attending can think about some things that they might do to uh, make things better. And so particularly this evening, there are an awful lot of ideas, I think. So might we start with Jackie? Uh, I would say become a regular reader of climate and environmental news. Subscribe to climate newsletters like the New York Times, Climate Forward, or Inside Climate News. Read books like Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction, and use these writings to commit to acting together with state and local groups to protect the land and the creatures around you. Thank you. Jason. So I already touched on one of the things, which is to have a meatless meal uh, every week. I mean, excuse me, a meatless day every week. Um, and most of my, my thoughts on this are really related to what individuals can do. Eat food in season, use smaller plates, take smaller portions, uh, use leftovers for meals, things that are kind of used to be the norm that are no longer the norm. Uh, and I think that th we need to get back to to this type of, of thinking. Thank you. And So I've pretty much said this before, but check the positions of the candidates for everything from the school board to the city and county to the state legislatures to Congress on the issues that are in their bailiwick running from climate change education, which we talked about, to land use, to energy efficiency in local governments, staffing for environmental agencies, the future of the National Environmental Policy Act, and support and funding for the decisions to be made on the Colorado River. Then tell your friends and together get out the vote. Thank you. Bob? I would only add that I, I you know, my experience, I've spent most of my career working at the federal level to try to sustain or or to actually implement and uh, federal level protections for resources, for wildlife, for public lands, for our air and our water. And I do think we need to broaden our focus. We need to build a stronger sense of community within our, our own neighborhoods and our, our states and our regions about protecting environmental quality. We need to embrace state legislators that may actually have the power to do some real good at a, at a state level. Um, and it's true, you can't solve everything with state legislation. You need something that they can deal with cross-boundary pollution. You need Those are all reasons why you need the federal government, even if it is crippled at this point, in its, or at least hobbled, I won't say crippled, but hobbled in its ability to respond to new challenges. Um, but, you know, all of this is building a stronger sense of community about environment, about the environment that matters. And uh, building relationships with state and local legislators can be enormously uh, beneficial for your community and for building that sense of trust and engagement. Thank you, John. Uh, I want to just build on what Bob said. I could not agree more. And that's what my opening comments were about. Uh, get together with your neighbors, residents in your town, talk about these issues, decide which legislation is the most important, which candidates will advance your ideas, particularly on biodiversity conservation and climate change. But also remember that what you're doing at the local level also has impacts all the way up at the international level. As I tried to point out earlier, protecting 30% of your local community environment is the same as protecting 30% at the international level of the planet, and it has to start at the local level. So I agree with Bob. Thank you, Jim. All the suggestions have been wonderful. And I would say too, to everyone, the chat has been terrific. So use your Zoom function to save the chat for yourself. 
and read that. That's a call to action. I've been educated <laughs> a lot just by reading the chat in this webinar. But what I have to say specifically uh, is a little different. First of all, don't fly as often as you have used to fly. Cut back on your flying. That is an enormous environmental impact. Um, then I would say take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act. And if you can put solar panels up on your roof, put them up. You get a 30% federal tax credit, no matter what your income is. That's huge. Insulating your home, installing a heat pump instead of a furnace or a boiler. Um, all of these things are now ones that you can be rewarded for financially through law and policy that was brought about by voters who voted for individuals who wanted different environmental policies. So I, I hope those suggestions are ones that you really might be able to put into effect. Thank you, Jim. And Class Act also has a call to action. Global environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, and climate change together constitute one of the biggest political issues of this election and of our times. Uh, yet the rhetoric of most candidates running uh, for the office at all levels puts the issues in the background. We are calling on you, all of you, to make sure that your environmental concerns rise to the top of your agendas in 2024 and are clearly expressed to those running for office. So make sure that you are in touch with those that uh, running for office. I want to thank Jackie for moderating even with unstable internet and for John and Anne and Jim, Jason and Bob for an extraordinary conversation. We've learned so much as you've seen in the chat. Uh, so many people have commented about how much we have learned. My thanks also go to our extraordinary production team, uh, John Noren, Sarah Ulrich, Richard Jackma, Rick Brotman, Diana Labanchu, Katie Marinello, and Kate Freed. And I want to thank all of you who have joined us this evening. This has been wonderful to have you with us this, at this important moment. I have two announcements before we end. First, that as uh, Jackie said early, uh, earlier, Yale University Press is just publishing John Cress's books, The Smithsonian Trees of North America. And I think it's a must have for, uh, for <laughs> anyone interested in our world. Thanks so much for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you uh, later this year when we will be doing a forum on aging. Good evening. <laughs>